for the start off. All right, welcome back, everybody. So I was in mid-thought, and then it uh, occurred to me to look over at the camera and uh, welcome the uh, uh, the audience that is viewing this workshop. If you're still with us, that you're viewing this workshop online. So um, uh, we were talking about the way in which this uh, book uh, that uh, those of you who are members of our community will have in your possession um, is bilingual. So each of the modules is not very thick, uh, but the book is uh, a little thicker than uh, than one would expect with the size of the modules because half of it is in Spanish. So that's what makes it the bilingual edition. And I suggested uh, that we uh, expand it even more and um, uh, translate it into Vietnamese for our Vietnamese community here. But one of the things that we're doing here this year is uh, we are having intercultural competencies workshops across the community. It's one of the uh, themes uh, which is why our sponsor, the Association of Theological School, was excited about this project. It's one of the themes, global awareness, of our accrediting body. But more importantly, it's one of the themes of our community. We are a very multicultural, diverse community. We come together under the uh, same mission statement, to cultivate Catholic leaders for the purpose of evangelization. That's the thing that binds all of us. That's the thing that unites all of us, is that one mission statement. In a, a way analogous to, all of us are bound uh, to one another by being um, created in the image and likeness of God. This book, as wonderful as it is, needs to be adapted to this particular community. Um, in the sense, Eve Congar was right, uh, the only proper ecclesiology is the local context. So uh, there may be those uh, who would disagree, um, but unless this book can actually speak to the needs of this particular community, then this book is not going to be very helpful. So part of the reason why we come together as a group is to um, um, form and inform uh, what uh, this community will produce as a handbook of intercultural competencies for itself. And so uh, the handbook we produce uh, will um, have a certain method to it. It'll have a certain template or character to it that other seminaries in this country will be able to adapt to their own needs. So. Um, it's one of the reasons why we're engaged in the study of this book, even though it's not in Vietnamese, as well as in Spanish and in English. Um, so uh, this book is an excellent starting place for our faculty meeting, which we had. We had 25 faculty and staff come to a workshop that we did all in one day. We're having all of the board of trustees, we've invited all of them, uh, to come to a workshop that we're going to do in October. Uh, all of the on-campus students have the opportunity to spend five weeks uh, doing one module a week, and all of the online students will have an opportunity to spend five weeks. So at the end of this fall term, this semester, uh, that we call fall 2017, we will be able to decide what to do for webinars we hope to have in the spring, what uh, is particularly unique about us that we would like to uh, share with others, and then a new book that we're going to write this spring that adapts intercultural competency to Holy Apostles College and Seminary on campus and abroad. The sun, I think I mentioned last week, never sets on Holy Apostles. Mm -hmm. We have students all over the world. And for such a small college in Connecticut, that's impressive that we can say uh, there is not one uh, spot on this earth where there is a student, um, where there is not a student while the sun is shining. In Australia, we have a student. In New Zealand, I think we have a student in New Zealand. Singapore, we have a student. Africa, we have many students. We have 44 students in East Africa. We have a student in West Africa. We have uh, students in Europe, students in South America. We have no students in Antarctica, but that's fine. 
because the sun still moves this way, doesn't move this way. So the sun does not set on the holy apostles. Okay. So if you look on page nine, what is intercultural competence? Your PowerPoint has three things on it. It talks about competencies in terms of knowledge. So three bullet points on the PowerPoint. Skills and attitudes. Knowledge, skills, and attitudes are ways in which we can intentionally engage somebody else in an appropriate manner. We are going to mess up. How quickly do we recover? We are going to um, exclude. How quickly do we re-include? And a lot of it is simply to step back and say, I need to examine my own um, thoughts, my own um, uh, understanding of the situation in which I find myself before I jump to a conclusion about it. All right. So um, knowledge on page nine. Um, there are uh, a few bullet points for each of these uh, ideas. Knowledge of more than one perspective on things. Knowledge of different interpretations of the same cultural reality. So um, uh, you could probably think of any event where you saw people interacting differently. And uh, you may have said, oh, these people are happy in this moment of tragedy. Or these people are um, uh, taking uh, whatever has happened here in a particular way that's different from the way I would take it. Knowledge of general dynamics of intercultural communication. Um, when I was living in North Africa, if we wanted to say no thank you, sometimes we would just do this. Um, we wanted to say I love you. You're all in my heart. When the president did this, sometimes they would say, he's saying you're all in my pocket. <laughs> um, when I got back to this country and my mother asked me if I wanted something, I went like this, meaning no thank you. And she said, well, do you want it or not? <laughs> Reverse culture shock was worse for me than culture shock. So I came back uh, completely amazed at, that I had lived here at all in the United States, given the experience I had uh, adapting and learning to love another culture. Yeah, even, how long were you there for? I was uh, in Tunisia for two years. So it's a standard Peace Corps experience. I would have signed up for a third year, uh, but the United States um, closed the Peace Corps operation in that country and moved to a different country. Um, it also has to do with even a simple handshake. Like in the Middle East, um, the handshake will not be as firm. You know, typically when you're greeting somebody, and then you will put your hand over your heart after that. Yeah. Uh, right. Unlike in the United States or in Western Europe, where you'll have a semi-firm handshake. Um, I noticed that is a significant difference. And it may mean different things to different people. Somebody right. who's expecting a firm handshake is not uh, going to appreciate uh, one that is not as firm. Right. You know, he's, he's not going to think that's as solid a deal or that it's as warm a greeting. Well, in the Middle East, sometimes well, even the salutations, you know, will change whether you're you're uh, Christian or Muslim in the Middle East as well. You know, so you were say? Yeah, I was saying. I was thinking about the Middle East. Also, a lot of times, like they greet each other with a kiss. Like even men will greet each other with a kiss. Right. Like you come here and you try to greet someone with a kiss. So, Oh, well, it's a boundary support. issue again. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, this is your space, this is my space. Right, or holding hands. Two men holding hands, walking down a mall in Qatar. That You've lived in the Middle East. <laughs> yes, I have. Yeah. yeah. So, in that case, that, I mean, you know, unless you understand the culture, you just understand that these two men are friends. Right. As opposed to Whereas if you saw yeah, it in this happened. country, uh, you might have a different uh, understanding of the dynamics of that relationship. Right. Um, good. 
knowledge of more than one's first language. That's, another, that's the last knowledge point. Um, when I grew up in East Texas, I knew one language. East Texas. East Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mean to offend any East. I don't mean to offend any East Texans here. Uh, but if I try, I am fairly certain that I can get my accent back. Um, but when I came to St. Louis, I quickly learned uh, that I needed to speak in a Midwestern dialect. And it wasn't St. Louis that did it to me, it was two years in North Africa. You cannot speak Arabic with an East Texan twang. You end up saying, as opposed to uh, the, yeah, that's in the Mole, you know, as opposed to uh, using um, the uh, sounds that are a part of another culture's um, language. Uh, in uh, Arabic, there are nine sounds that an Arab speaker, a native Arab speaker makes that um, an American, that an East Texan does not make. There's gutturals. Ah. <laughs> so those sounds we don't make. So. Um, uh, when I learned how to speak Arabic, I spoke Arabic, uh, leaving out all of those sounds. And in some instances, it made a difference. Um, imagine if you ask for, um, if you say bread is hubs, hubs. So there's a, and love is hub, hub. If you ask for love instead of bread, in some context, that's, uh, that uh, can create a, a, a very interesting situation. So, um, but likewise, uh, speakers of another language that make sounds that are not made in English will try to speak English using those other sounds. And it makes uh, for difficulty in understanding. So accent mapping, uh, which is to try to um, uh, make the sounds uh, made by the culture into which you're entering is useful if you can develop that skill in uh, learning a language from another culture. But likewise, um, uh, like what Eric was saying earlier, uh, more than accent mapping, adapting to the cultural norms is a skill. It's something that can be learned. Uh, so skills entail the following, ability to empathize, ability to tolerate ambiguity, and the third one, ability to adapt communication and behavior, to blend. But not only to blend, but to understand. Because if you change just a little bit to help uh, in your understanding of another culture, you develop something um, in the way, by way of empathy that, um, that you didn't have before. And you develop a way to embrace that other culture. Remember um, what Christ told us? Two things, love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You learn to embrace another culture. The more you learn to embrace another culture, the more you learn to love your neighbor as yourself. Attitudes, openness to others and other cultures, wanting to learn and engage other cultures, understanding intercultural interaction as a way of life, not as a problem to be solved. So um, um, lateness, for instance. Uh, in um, some cultures, uh, the sense of time is different. So for instance, if a meeting is called for 10 a.m., then uh, in order to fully engage in that culture, you show up and at, at what, 10.30, right, or you come together at 10, but you're not starting the meeting until 10.30 or 10.40, because everybody's got to greet one another, and everybody has to reestablish the relationships uh, that were severed in the passage of time from the last time they saw one another, even if that last time they saw one another was the day before. <laughs> I learned, uh, seven or eight different exchanges when I lived in North Africa that were part of the ritualistic greetings. Hello, how are you? Are you fine? Yes, I am fine. 
How is your family? Are they fine? Yes, they are fine. Back and forth for minutes. In America, we'd say, so. <laughs> so. Everything you need to know is embraced in that one syllable. So. <laughs> so. It means I'm, I'm cool, everything's great, my family's good, I've got problems, I'm not gonna share them with you <laughs> in this short exchange that we have about whether or not I want to buy bread as opposed to love. Um, mindfulness, being aware of another culture. Just being aware of another person that uh, all of us were created in only one way. I'm jumping back on module one here. What was the one way in which each of us was created? And it applies to every single human person on the planet Earth. We're all, we're all created good. Each and every one of us is created good. There are things that happen to us along the way that can change a good will into a bad will. But the human person always has dignity. The human person is greater than the sum of his activities and actions. It's why we say in Mass, um, um, look on our faith, look on the faith of the church, look on the way in which we uh, desire to be with you, God, and not on all of our mistakes and all of our sins and all of our the things that we do uh, as we trip through life each day. Um, in one way or another, offending God and man. So, um, if we were to talk about what is intercultural competence, it's these things, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, Um, and it's an understanding of where you are in the culture in which you are placed. So um, our guidebook gives us two things. It says it's dependent upon whether you're part of the prevailing culture or whether you're part of the minority culture. Now, if you're part of the prevailing culture in any group, everything you do is normal. Well, there are exceptions. But much of what you do in encountering others is part of a fabric of what other people would do in encountering others. You're engaged in something called cultural norms. You have a firm handshake. What's up? You, um, you, uh, uh, stand in line and wait for your turn. There are places in uh, North Africa and in Italy where they do not know what a line is. There's no sense of a queue. There's no sense of a, I'm going to wait. Go to the post office. If you can met, fight your way to the teller in the post office, to the clerk, you succeeded. And you've got to stand firm and not allow yourself to be elbowed away by sweet women in sepsaris <laughs> who will elbow you in order to get in front of the line. There's no sense of a queue. So in a place where uh, the dominant culture understands what a queue is, people in the dominant culture are going to line up in a queue. Someone who is not from the dominant culture is going to walk straight up to the front and create an international incident where he is politely asked to go to the back of the line. In his or her mind, that line does not exist. And so that person has to learn that cultural norm. And that's the second one. If you come from another culture, if you're not part of the prevailing culture, you're going to encounter difficulties until you learn the cultural norms of the prevailing culture. So um, this leads to uh, the opportunities some people have for code switching. 
for acting in one way in their own culture and for changing the way in which they act in the dominant culture. Uh, this is more of the same. If a member of the prevailing culture can get along with very little knowledge of other cultures, members expect those of other cultures to learn to operate in the prevailing culture. Have um, you ever uh, watched a television program in the United States or a movie where somebody who is part of the dominant culture, an American, yells at somebody who is not and says, why don't you learn English? Why don't you learn how to drive? This is particularly important for people who are coming from England who are used to driving in the wrong side of the road. Do you hear that? The wrong side of the road. I've made a value judgment on an entire nation. Because, of course, the right side of the road is the one on which we drive. Um, as a member of the dominant culture, I do not have to learn Vietnamese. I do not have to learn Arabic. I do not have to learn Spanish. These are things that I expect other people who speak these languages to adapt to me because I own the cultural norm. I exemplify the cultural norm. I reify the cultural norm. I tell you how you should act to me because I own the cultural norm. Um, if a member of a culture other than the prevailing one, so somebody who is not from that culture, enters that culture, um, that person has to have already learned about intercultural competencies and intercultural communication just to survive in that culture. That person um, had to in order to survive. So when I went to North Africa, I had to learn um, a great many things. One, modesty. You cannot go into a government office in North Africa wearing shorts. They want you to wear long pants. So I showed up, waited three hours, made it to the door, and was turned away. And I actually got angry. I said, nobody told me that I should be wearing pants on a hundred a day that was 120 degrees. Why didn't somebody come out and tell me that I should be wearing pants? I've been sitting here for three hours wearing shorts, meaning I'm not wearing pants. And they said, you didn't ask. Besides, you should know that if you come to a government office, you must wear pants. I went home, put on some pants, went back and expected to be received at the front of the line for time served. They put me in the back of the line. I said, but I've been here. And they said, and there you will stay until you make your way up. Now, government offices are run differently than post offices, at least uh, if you were trying to get your um, paperwork done. They actually take people in the order received. If I went to a post office, I could have just elbowed my way up to the front, knocked over some Tunisian uh, old ladies and bought my stamps. Okay, that brings us to the exercise for the last half hour, the last 20 minutes. There are five parameters of interacting with other cultures. What I'd like to do is divide the group. One, two, three, four, five. Chief Daniel, if you would, sit with him. And three of you, four of you, four of you, three of you. What I want you to do is take one of these parameters and just discuss it amongst yourselves for 15 minutes. And then the last part, I'll ask you what you learned. All right? So this table, parameter number one, collectivism versus individualism. Uh, review it with one another and talk about it. Do you have any examples? A good way to do this exercise is to come up with at least one example of an encounter or an interaction. Second one, 
Uh, parameter two, hierarchy versus equality. So uh, <coughs> review what it says and just talk about it. Come up with an example of an interaction that could go wrong between two people from different cultures. Number three, low tolerance of ambiguity versus high tolerance of ambiguity. Personally, I like lots of ambiguity. I can hide in ambiguity, especially if I'm elsewhere in another culture. Um, so um, review it amongst yourselves. And that wasn't an original idea on my part. I'm certain that my wife thinks I like ambiguity as well. Like, but the dishes are in the sink. I didn't know I was supposed to wash them. <laughs> Number four, masculine versus a feminine understanding of gender roles. Right here. And number five, lived experiences versus abstract time orientation. Just discuss these sections among yourselves. All right. Yes. Sister. Um, so um, uh, the key word is ambiguity. So uh, whether or not something is concrete, like uh, you must do this, then this, then this, or whether it's um, if it has low ambiguity, that means you know exactly what you're supposed to do. If there's high ambiguity, you don't. So, like for instance, I set this in the middle of the table and said do something with this. This exercise, for instance, is high ambiguity. Everybody's going to come up with a different idea of what to do. Maybe you agree, maybe you won't, but you don't know what I'm thinking that you see. And I haven't told you. I just said, do something. And I might say, well, he's getting wrong. At which point you'd say, well, you should have done. It's not what I want you to do. Because you should be able to understand the culture. So, other problems that you should have done. You know what? More culture. Now, there's three. Every event, especially unfortunate ones, is an explanation. So, a low tolerance of ambiguity means I need to know exactly what happens. What is the meaning? High tolerance doesn't need an explanation. You don't need to know everything that happens in your place. I was very the exercise is very simple. Take a group of people, um, at least two or more per group, and we have here uh, three and four per group, and just ask them to review this and come up with an example. So in reviewing uh, differences between a culture of collectivist versus a culture of individualist, first thing is to understand collectivism, the second thing is to understand individualism, and then to try to come up with an example of um, uh, what um, kind of encounter uh, what kind of way something could go wrong if people did not understand one another's cultures in this case. And you, uh, you're going to get some good dialogue at the table, uh, but you're also going to get some good insight that there is indeed such a thing as an individualist culture, or there is indeed such a thing as a collectivist culture. Now, there may be, um, there may be, uh, it's a spectrum, it's not an either or, usually. Um, so in, if that's the case, uh, then that's another point of dialogue where you can say, well, wait a second, uh, this is highly collectivist uh, in its operation in one way, uh, but it's highly uh, individualistic in its operation in another way. So um, uh, that's where you, um, where you would have uh, room for engagement. Um, in the same way we had in the iceberg exercise, where some observable behaviors uh, appeared in one way, but they had deeper meaning. So, um, if you would, uh, Eric, uh, 
uh, pan the audience? That doesn't mean they have a minute. That is a given minute. But they definitely look at the state they prepare in a vicious fashion. Oh, yeah. Big, 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 Can you write the name of 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 the she, uh, she uh, went to India a few, uh, a number of years ago, and she uh, she uh, did an she did an interview um, with uh, members of a of a tribe, and she uh, and and she noticed that when she asked everyone about the, about how did the tribe. Uh, uh, how did the tribe stand to X? Um, and then they said, fine. Then how did your group stand to X? Well, fine. Here, then, here, here's the thing. But, I mean, if you really go back to any person's cultural origins, you know, there is marriage arrangement. There is approval process it's, because we, in, in Western society because the impulse for individualism and the way our, our societies have developed people get right yes that's very recent really the 20th century you know um because my grandparents came from a very traditional yeah. culture. He says that, yeah. It's yeah. From a very small island on the west coast of Ireland, which was very clannish. Uh, yeah. Okay, everyone had the same culture. <coughs> I think, um, Yes, it's pretty very clearly. Okay, we have uh, like a few dualism, few dualism, few dualism. It's a long yeah. What's the word? F E E F E G U D A L I. Fidelism. Oh, okay, and that culture, like the yeah, like not like India has the caste system, but this is more is it agricultural or so. With different clans, you mean? Is that what it is? Feudalism. Yeah. Cl different clans. Yeah. They is the usually respect the the man then and woman. So also they have a very high, uh, very uh, very uh, particular hierarchy in the mm. family for the kingship. Usually they choose the king among that uh, their uh, family, not outside of family of the king. And then the hierarchy okay. have to be appointed in the family of the king, and then and and then uh, if the father pass away and the son will be the king in the next generation. Okay. So they have a very hierarchy. That is the one guy of uh, hierarchy. So here it says that is the more person have the more power in the higher status. Your authority is inherited. It's been in the king is a pass away and then his son will be the king in the next okay. generation. And um, for equality, I think Probably is a democracy. Mm -hmm. Probably well, that's what they're trying to show anyway. Yeah, democracy. I think probably for everyone is equal. Well, then everyone has a vote. Yeah, has to be vote. Yeah, yeah, because I think the church is probably ideal for being has a hierarchy, but still has that e like seeing everyone. Res Everyone's equal and with respect, but they still have a structure. But hierarchy is uh, energetic, totally different. Totally yeah. different because the hierarchy in the church is that um, we have like um, 
the more power you have is a uh, even though it's uh, the, the start you have but actually is a uh, the more you become a slave for people yeah sort in, in the middle of yeah. theology yeah the church but like in countryside we decide our times <laughs> if you want to plant at 10 in the morning or 11 in the morning doesn't matter doesn't matter today or tomorrow today doesn't matter doesn't matter but if your family's having a party your neighbor you're going to emphasize the relationship with the person yes. first over the we got to get the job yes because for the the, the machine like that if you don't run this the, the company it didn't work there's work but uh, for uh, for the farm for the plant we plant the tree even though today maybe we don't water we we, we uh, do not water but the tree continue to grow that's right <laughs> yeah. maybe better or not but it's you water tomorrow yeah yeah, yeah. We water tomorrow. Uh, yes. it's interesting how hmm. we approach time based on how we're raised I think the harm or the habit or like that depend on uh, the still uh, I said still the, situ the situation. <laughs> oh, thank you, brother. You. <laughs> where we live and where we go. You, I agree. You're absolutely right. Yes. <laughs> Oh, in a, in a hierarchy is a some some tribes in Vietnam or in especially in Africa they live in a village. Yeah. The person who is the oldest in the field is will be the, the highest. Yeah. Starter. So they live in like a tribe. A tribe of people. So Israel. Yeah. Yeah, probably in Vietnam, in the high mountain in Vietnam. Well, that makes good sense then, because yeah. they live in like a tribe. I think I'm thinking your example, like if there's a. The oldest, Again, usually the oldest, of, uh, the bus in the oldest in the village. Uh, like if there's a church that uh, has a lot of different nationalities and say, and the, the thing about the uh, elders, or some people have this, the elders are really, uh, and it's true, probably have a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, but someone who's young might have a lot of input to give, but there might be a bias that, well, if he's too young to, you know, give us any information, so. They may let them talk, but they don't take anything from the younger person. Even though that might be... In American like might have, culture? Or she might have said something that was important. But yeah. then, Hi, don't I, I would say we have more people. Yeah, yeah. high tolerance. Yeah. I think it's in your country is high tolerance. Because every, everything you do, you need to know first. Like you, you know first when you do it. Um, well, that would be low tolerance. That's, that's yeah. low, that's low tolerance. Right, that's yeah. low tolerance. So, in in the world of business, business would be very low tolerance uh -huh. because you would um, expect certain results to um, yeah, yeah. become profitable. So, which part is high tolerance in your country? Um, probably uh, cultural events. Uh, so I mean, uh, you can you can have certain things that would be high tolerance, and certain structures that would be low tolerance. So. Um, if, um, if I am about to go out with a group of friends and I don't know where we're going to go, it wouldn't really matter to me. Uh, perhaps they would do X, Y, or Z. We're together. As a group. This doesn't bother me. Yeah. I am the first mom. So, uh, what, 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 uh, for example, my, my mom, she usually, usually believes that um, 
she, she, she have something to sell. But for her, the, the first person to come to buy something is very important. It meaning during this day, she will sell a lot of that that a flow to <laughs> But but she believes something is have meaning something to 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 her. Um, uh, you, you mean like if uh, she believes uh, she has one opinion, she believes like the first per, the first person come to buy something, it meaning during this day. See you sell a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Can we say uh, something about the uh, daily daily work daily working? Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think it's invisible. Yeah. 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 And government too. There might be. Hit, it may not be like promoted in the culture as much, like have a hierarchy, but usually if there's a boss but or like, uh, I, I think like, for example, in here, for the most, the highest, we are like look like a low, something like that, with a hierarchy. Yeah. We are director, we are student, uh, the professor too. Yeah. So, so, yeah, there's so like but when communication like that, we eating together or something. So we see like the, not that it's easier than uh, do not have much distinction. Yeah, Karen's a bit more open because she's not going to look, I'm the rector or I. <laughs> Or that he's the highest and you're the lowest. So, I mean, there could be places where they would have separation of just novices, seminarians, and which is just for some other reasons to do that. They do that sometimes for reasons. The sphere and some they sit together and they eat and they share together and they they talk together. It's easier than. I. I was trying to, I remember with the army, someone mentioned this with the army because they have lieutenants, different ranks in the army, and they were having a seminar for conflict resolution. And I think the captain and the lieutenant walked in, and person, oh, I'm captain. This also today, there's no, there's no, uh, the word they used was there's no ranking when we're doing this because we're all going to treat ourselves equally here for this seminar. And he says, we don't do that here. So he kept like the lieutenant was the lieutenant, the captain was the captain, and he was up. The captain, the captain was lower, and the lieutenant was up here. And the person who was running the retreat went, Well, I'm going to do it. He said, Okay. Just, just figured a way that would help dialogue by just trying to get rid of that. He was the, you know, the, the lieutenant, which was higher than the captain. He was trying to get, she was trying to get the person who was the lieutenant just to put the rank away. The, like the hierarchy, because in certain exercises, it was going to be better. But, do, you and, think, do you think, uh, I think that's the hierarchy. To go to drink beer under the tree, like in the, and then you walk home. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. I think if we have money, living in Vietnam, is uh, and you can enjoy uh, your life than American, because and uh, the people, the people here is like uh, very just. It's the adjustment. Yes, mm -hmm. like we we can you cannot copyright the dishes from another. But in Vietnam is <laughs> that okay? Like okay. I, I, I don't like Vietnam like that. But, but uh, another reason like, in my in my country is we. We have a time and we 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 live the society, the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's very good. like like here sometimes this this house, this family and their family we like uh, to but never know each other. But in our country, in our town, like today I um, I cook, I I make a tea and cook some food, invite my, my neighbor. To my oh. house today and tomorrow, tomorrow we take that we take that and we go and, and they and they'll do for you the next day yeah exactly. make tea bring food yes 
Very nice. When I was two and I was child, my father always asked me to go to uh, my neighbor's house to, to invite them. But now it's, we have phone and we call. You call, <laughs> call me. <laughs> like Bill Fox. Yes, yeah, yeah, call me. Call me anytime. <laughs> because we have a, a lot, a lot of time, a free time. And the technology you have now yeah. that you didn't have when you were growing mm -hmm. up. But now, the problem now is that uh, people growing up, many people, and the land, the soil, small, small, small. And we don't have uh, land for uh, for farm a lot like here. So, so we need have... a lot of young people go to city to work and look like. But when we get home, we live uh, very very time. But when you leave the city, you come back right into your culture. Yeah. The way you were growing up, spending the time. Yeah, yes. But if we go to like uh, Saigon or Hanoi, we work, look like American. It's yeah. very much like America. Yes. Very or much. London or mm -hmm. Berlin and Germany. Very time is money. Yes, time for money. But differently, we spend uh, uh, evening time. For beer everywhere. Even in the city. <laughs> Even in the city. <laughs> Even though you have to get up for work the next day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's easier when you're younger. So it is time. So we're at the time. So we're not going to um, necessarily um, spend a great deal of time sharing, uh, but just some things that you got out of the exercise. Uh, some. Um, uh, what did you learn from engaging in the exercise, not necessarily the content of each of the uh, parameters? Go ahead. Well, there's a, uh, one of the one of the faculty members here that uh, that that, uh, that um, that, that, that I, I, I like to talk to quite a lot, traveled to India um, a number of years ago. And when she had interviewed uh, tr um, uh, certain tribes people in India, she found that um, when asked about um, the, the, the uh, experience on a given, on a given uh, uh, activity, she found that, uh, that that if she asked about how did the tribe how did the tribe do, how did the group do, and how did the family do, they both they, they, they answered with, with 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 no problem. However, when she asked about how did you do with an, an individual, they completely they can almost they almost shut down. They didn't know what what uh, what what, they, what she was talking about because the topic was just so foreign to try to understand uh, themselves as apart from the uh, culture or the society in which they lived. Correct. Okay. Very connected to culture, I guess. Extremely mm -hmm. to basically more Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, anybody else uh, discovered something? Yeah. Well, with our group to just try to get some understanding on the concepts of hierarchy and quality and seeing that it's not so black and white and then just uh, seeing that there could be a mixture like some people really want things equal but then there's always some kind of thing realize that we talk about structure and how structure is necessary so if it ended up saying everything's the same it's not like it doesn't like it's not livable you can't really have and I, you can pretend that but in the real world when you get out of to uh, uh, wake up, you have to make distinctions, and you have to. So there's always some sort of hierarchy, but it could be. And we talk about, I think, general and attitude too, because I think we were discussing about Father Moses, the highest, we're the lowest. But in a way, the attitude isn't that they. They were mentioning how it's really great that they can eat together with, you know, the Father Moses. It's not. Uh, it's sort of not like in some places. Like this place is different, but in some places, if there was a boss. And a worker, they don't interact because they have that kind of bias, I guess. So I, I was, I thought of just some concept of something that could be problematic if you're with in a culture where 
the man is supposed to be approached first, but here I have the attitude of equality, and you walk, walk, walk to his wife and start talking to her, that could be offensive. So it's sort of, again, trying to get that balance of hierarchy, equality, and just seeing that even in America where they're trying to be very equal, like in a working setting, like I, I, well, I'm from Canada, I was working in a post office for a while, there's definitely a lot of structures and a lot of things of bosses that some good, some bad, and that definitely when you were suggest, you know, wanted to put input, if you were just working, even people who worked there for 20 years, the guy who's coming off from the, from uh, a lot of education, which makes sense, he's, in, he's learning administration, so you know, he can know a lot of things to, to make, to get things going, but sometimes they wouldn't listen to people who are considered lower than them because they just they, they disregarded and I was just thinking too, they mentioned the culture of elders, like a lot of places will have respect for the elder and go to them for advice, but if we're in a parish that has a lot of different nationalities and ones that have that concept that if they have young people that suggest things that the, if the people are from a different background and culture, they might think, well, that's nice, but they don't take that advice because they might have the framework of thinking, well, the elders are the ones with the great advice. So it's trying to get an understanding because it could be reversed too. Like sometimes you figure all the old people, like a lot of places, especially in the developing worlds, might look at an older person that, well, they've passed their prime. It's the new people with, you know, the, the new, you know, progressive and no, no things so that it could be an advice on both sides. That, that the young people are listened to, but old people aren't, or the other way around from the culture. Well, uh, notice um, in each of these sections, in yours uh, included, you've got things that are put against one another, um, dichotomies almost. So uh, you've got uh, collectivism versus individualism here. Yours was hierarchy versus equality. Uh, low and high tolerance of ambiguity. Um, distinct versus overlapping understanding of gender roles and lived experience versus abstract time orientation. So uh, there are um, uh, things that are paired saying that it's this or this in, um, in a sense of uh, what is this or this, there may be something else. There may be um, a both and rather than an either or as, as uh, I, I think you're expressing in, in what you were saying. So, um, but do these either ors, do these pairs help us understand uh, or make us more aware that there are different ways of seeing the world? And that would be uh, perhaps a takeaway that um, it may be that I'm from a culture that sees the world in five different ways here and that I encounter a different culture that sees the world in five other ways. So at least if I go into any situation understanding that there are different worldviews, I'm going to be less likely to be judgmental or to uh, pursue conflict that's unnecessary. And a lot of times we pursue unnecessary conflict. And we do it simply because people act differently than the way we come to expect they should be acting, or the way we think that they should be acting. And so um, in terms of intercultural competencies, a lens through which to see the world um, is helpful. And we will pick up from there when we come back next time. So Father Skip is here to uh, say uh, closing prayer, and then there's ice cream if anybody wants to take ice cream with them. If you did not get enough ice cream, uh, at the very beginning, I bought five boxes of ice cream. So there's lots of ice cream. So, go ahead. so for those who are fasting, uh, in honor of the uh, second to the last uh, um, apparition of our blessed uh, mother at Fatima, uh, the fast is off. So you're good to eat ice cream now. But today is September 13th, right? Yes. So this is the second to the last apparition of Our Lady Fatima to the three seers in Portugal. Right, so 13th. Uh, yeah, and then the last was October 13th. So, nice little thing to remember as you pray over the next next month. You're in the gun lap, as they say. So do, uh, make sure you do a little, uh, little Fatima reflection here.
100th year. I, it's, it's big. Okay. So we'll pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open our minds and hearts to learn of you. And we ask uh, the uh, maternal protection of our Blessed Mother uh, to be with us and to guide us uh, ever closer to her son. We ask uh, for a, a good night's rest as uh, we uh, get ready for the next day. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eat ice cream in peace. Thank you. All right. Thank you.